Good evening, everyone. Welcome. It's uh, good to see see everyone trickling in, finding uh, finding their way in uh, for tonight's tonight's learning on on pure Kea vote. Um, for those who have been with us these last few weeks, you know that this is part of our our larger larger series, uh, Sinai Bound, as we're um, taking a look into into the pure Kea vote, the uh, and the the, the themes of, of that text, and some of the, some of the questions around. Um, around community and obligation and our, our connection with one another as we move towards and think towards creating our own community covenant here, here at BJ. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled tonight to, uh, to welcome, uh, to, 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 look, to learn with us, to lead us um, in, our, in our learning Rabbi Shmuley Yankowitz, uh, who joins us from, uh, from Scottsdale, Arizona. You can see the Arizona sun uh, coming through the, the blinds uh, behind him. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Rabbi Shmuley Yankowitz, he has twice been named one of America's top rabbis by Newsweek and has been named by the forward as one of the 50 most influential Jews and the most and one of the most inspiring rabbis in America. Rabbi Yankowitz is the author of 22 books on Jewish ethics, and his writings have appeared in outlets as diverse as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and the Atlantic, among other sec secular and religious publications. Um, he has served as a speaker at the World Economic Forum in Davos and, uh, and a Rothschild Fellow in, uh, in Cambridge. Uh, Rosh Muli received a master's from Harvard University, a master's from Yeshiva University, and his doctorate from Columbia. He was ordained as a rabbi by Yeshivat Chovavei Torah, along with two private ordinations in Israel, and serves now as the president and dean of Valley Beit Midrash um, in Arizona. Uh, rabbi Shmuley Yankowitz, it is such a privilege to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much, Cantor Mintz. It's a great to be with you and with everyone here. And I miss New York City so much. And so I feel like I'm in Manhattan for the next um, hour and 15 minutes with all of you. Um, and I used to be at BJ um, fairly regularly for meetings, for activism, for learning. And so I really love that congregation and your clergy and your staff and the community. So thank you for being here. And um, I am looking forward to engaging with you on this topic. Um, and I had assumed the reason that um, Roly and, and, and Dave and whoever else was involved invited me was because I recently through the CCAR press, the reform, um, the reform movements publishing house published a social justice commentary on Perkia vote. Um, and so I invested a lot of time and thought into this. So if you go to CCR Press website or Amazon or wherever you go, you can see that commentary. And if you don't use it already, it might be another a helpful tool as you're exploring Pirkei Avot in the coming months. Um, so first, uh, oh, one other thing about the community, which is that just a few years ago, um, Rabbi Felicia and a bunch of teens from the congregation came to us to work at the border. And we did work with them, um, to, you know, with asylum seeker, and refugee, and, and immigrant uh, work we did together, humanitarian relief. So that was another connection with the community that I loved. So before we jump in, and I'm going to share my screen with some sources, I want to ask you two questions, and I want to invite you to write, type into the chat if you're comfortable doing so. The first question I want to ask you to type in the chat is, what so far in your peer Kiavo learning um, if not going forward beyond 317, but up till now, is something that really resonates, really sticks. Like you'd almost call it your favorite, if you would. Like what is something that feels like this? Ah, your teen was there. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and there's a swimmer in Arizona. I wonder if you're related or not. Um, and so um, uh, please write in the chat something that is really um, has been a powerful learning um, or set something really sticking with you from Pirkei Avot so far. And you can go beyond 317 if you need to. Let's just get our juices flowing, remembering what, the, what this work is about, okay? And if it's not a specific quote, maybe there's just a general idea that is resonating for you. Dave, are we normally a shy group or are we still thinking? 
you know, I, I've noticed that we tend to warm up as the as the hour and fifteen great, minutes. Great, great. It will happen. It will happen. I want to get our juices flowing so we can zoom out. Good. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. Oh, hi, Nancy. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So Rabbi Tarfon, Lo Alecha Hamlacha Ligmor. It's just one of the most powerful rabbinic teachings for me, and I know for many of us around uh, understanding that we can't complete all the work, but we can't not participate. So thank you. Let's see if there's some others who are going to chat over there. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a second question as well, if this helps also. Maybe something that's not sitting great with you. Was there an idea you disagreed with or one that created tension for you? Um, yo, hi, Sarah. Yeah, the world stands on three things. Thank you for that. Torah, Abu Dat, and Gimelit Chasadim. Thank you for that beautiful idea. Deborah from Yehuda, be resolute to align your actions with the transcendent purpose. Great. Our kavanah, our intentionality. Love it. Great. It's just amazing how much of our contemporary ethics in the Jewish community are built around Pirkei Avot. And um, okay, one you don't appreciate, Nancy shares, you are a putrid drop. Okay, I appreciate you sharing that because in the Musar world, there were two primary camps. There was Slobodka and Navarik. And one camp said, you are the lowest, you are nothing in Navarik. They would hang a dead fish from the ceiling of their Beit Midrash to remind you, you're gonna die and you're nothing, you're a drop, right? And they thought that would make us better people to hold the perspective of our nothingness. And then there was Slobodka that said, no, no, you want people to actualize their potential, tell them how great they are. And it, and it tried to build up the greatness of the human self. So I both resonate for me, um, both the type of you are nothing and the type of you're, you're great building off weakness, building off strength, but I, I understand Nancy's concern there. And then Sonia, isn't there something about the minority view that should always be included? Thank you for that. Susan, be exceedingly humble for mortals hope is the grave. Yep. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Okay, good. So that's a good, that is a good start for us here. Feel free to share others as well. My approach might be a little different than some of your past ones. I, I want to surf upon the Pirkei Avot tonight rather than then dive into it. Um, and so we're going to kind of say it and name it, and you may have some thoughts or questions on it, but then I wanna just pick the one main idea um, from the beginning and kind of really grapple with that idea with some other texts I have together, and then we'll open up the conversation. So before we do that, I wanna ch chant a little something with you because um, we say in Musar that the longest path in the world is the path from the head to the heart which is to say it's very easy to learn and to know, but to move that knowing deeper, deeper into integration, to emotional intelligence, to sensitivity, to empathy, to transformation. So I want to invite you in this chant to um, close your eyes if you're comfortable once you have the words and just use it as an opportunity to try to internalize more deeply what we're going to engage together. And the words I'm gonna put in the chat and um, it's our theme for tonight, which is that a little bit, um, a little bit matters. Everything matters. And the words are from the Chavot HaLevavot, Meyat Min HaOr Doche Harbe Choshech. A little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. And I, I like to chant this uh, consistently because it's very easy in our age to feel powerless, to feel cynical, to feel like little things don't matter. Why should I show up at Minyan? Why should I show up at a rally or protest? Why should I sign on to something? Why should I do anything? Because I'm, I, I have no power. I have no potential to change. Why should I donate, right? It's all just broken. And I think our, our teachings remind us over and over that the seemingly, the ostensibly little things are actually what keeps the world going. And this is part of my faith that at every given moment, there is far more good than evil that is happening. Yes, the headlines in the news tell us of all the wars, and the atrocities and the corruption. And yet it doesn't tell us that at this very moment, there's millions of people holding the hands of dying strangers, millions of teachers patiently teaching children, millions of people giving tzedakah and doing chesed every time. And so I think we have to remind ourselves of that um, all the time. So here it is, I'm gonna put it in the chat. And, and the first time you can uh, hear me and then join me. <clears throat> Meat 
دوخه هار به خوشه کتر بیات به ناور دوخه هار به خوشه بیات به ناور دوخه هار به خوشه Now in English, a little bit of light dispels the darkness. A little bit of light dispels the darkness. So friends, I hope you'll hold on to that kavana tonight, that kavana, that intentionality, that our learning matters. And our learning matters not only for ourselves and for, for those around us and for the potential of transformation. So I'm going to jump into a text here. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to call for a volunteer to read this for us. Um, I, um, Reb Dave, has the, has the custom been to read it um, in, in Hebrew first, or English, or has it kind of gone back and forth? Um, I think we've, we've tended to lean, uh, lean toward, towards English. Great, uh, great. Let's do yeah. that. Thank you. So can I get a volunteer? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand, just jump in if you're really willing to read this for us in English. Just know that I'm going to cut you off a few times. I hope you're okay. okay. I'm ready. Here we go. Thank you. Um, Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria said, where there is no Torah, there is no right conduct. Where there is no right conduct, there is no Torah. Good, I'm going to stop you there. Thank you, Ronald. So this is going to be the theme we're going to look at tonight. Im ein Torah We've heard this many times before, but we're going to try to dive in a little deeper. Where there's no Torah, where there's um, there's no ethics, where there's no ethics, there's no Torah. Okay, so let's keep going. Where there is no wisdom, there is no fear of God. Where there is no fear of God, there is no wisdom. Where there is no understanding, there is no knowledge. Where there is no knowledge, there is no understanding. Where there is no bread, there is no Torah. Where there is no Torah, there is no bread. He used to say, one whose wisdom exceeds his deeds, to what may he be compared? To a tree whose branches are numerous, but whose roots are few. So that when the wind comes, it uproots it and overturns it, as it is said, he shall be like a bush in the desert, which does not sense the coming of good. It is set in the scorched, scorched, scorched places of the wilderness, the barren land without inhabitants. Jeremiah 17, 6. But one whose deeds exceed his wisdom, to what may he be compared? To a tree whose branches are few, but roots are many, so that even if all the winds in the world come and blow upon it, they cannot move it out of its place. As it is said, he shall be like a tree planted by waters, sending forth its roots by a stream. It does not sense the coming of heat. It leaves, its leaves are ever fresh. It has no care in the year of drought, it does not cease to yield fruits. Thank you so much, Ronald, for reading that for us. So I want to take some initial reactions um, to this text. Any initial things that jump out to you that resonate or don't resonate or questions or thoughts folks want to share? I can't see hands, so if you'll just unmute and talk since we're still sharing screen. Thank you so much. Um, my name, it's, my name's Tony. Hi, Tony. And hi. So in the beginning, everything's kind of where everything kind of plays on the other. It's very circular. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you can do a ton with that. But one thing that just really jumped out at me was toward the end, where it says, one whose deeds exceed his wisdom, to what may he be compared? I wonder how your deeds exceed your wisdom. How do you do something? How do you accomplish something? How do you act in a way that's beyond what you can understand and what mm -hmm. you can control and what your mind can conceive of? 
Mm, mm, I love that question, Tony. So let me let me jump in there for a moment um, because of how important that is. First of all, we know that this is something that Plato in all of his wisdom misunderstood. Plato thought that if you know the good, you will do the good. But we know today that there's not a correlation between an Ivy League degree and virtue. There's not this direct correlation between more education um, and people being more virtuous. Um, Can I just interrupt for a second? I yes, wasn't please. hearing the word wisdom as being synonymous with education. Thank you, thank you. That's an important I, was, I mean, wisdom can come from, you know, a janitor, but yes, exactly. I wasn't yeah. hearing the two being synonymous. Great, I love it. So I would say, um, my thinking here is, there's a concept in the Talmud called Yeridat Hadorot, which means that in every generation since Sinai, their generations um, descend in our, in our wisdom. And there is a competing view uh, towards Yemei HaMashiach that we are actually getting closer to the light rather than further from the light. Are we progressives or do we think society is degenerating in a sense? And, um, and so what do we do with this idea? Our sense that there's progress and get our sense that something is being lost. So my read here is that we are progressing in the individual's ability to hold complex wisdom. We hold more knowledge than ever before in history. We have access to more information which can inform that wisdom. We have access to more relationships and diverse relationships than it was precedented. Um, and so in the complexity realm, we're progressing as 21st century people. But in the simple wisdom realm, in the realm of simple wisdom, right. we are declining. Simple truths of love, of relationships, of simple ethics. Um, you know, simple notions of divinity and what it means to correct. We are skeptics. We have trouble with simplicity. And so to Tony's great question here around what does it mean to hold wisdom but do more than your wisdom? How is that possible to do? I think that part of it can be um, we can have certain kinds of complex wisdom which actually um, to some degree prevent us from acting upon simple wisdom. Um, and part of it as, as 21st century liberals, we are afraid of being duped. If I participate, I might be duped. If I vote for this person that I'll perfectly, perfectly support, maybe I'll be duped and they'll be corrupt too. If I donate to this cause, maybe they're not gonna use it well. They're just like, you know, not using the money. If I pray, maybe I'll be duped because it's like this prayer doesn't work. I, I don't wanna be caught in a moment of prayer. Kant said the modern person is embarrassed when they're found in prayer because it's like, whoa, you believe in something? Like you must be a fool, like if you believe in something, right? And so, um, so I love Tony's uh, question there around how deeds can exceed wisdom because to some degree, certain types of wisdom can prevent us from the realm of action. Thank you for that. Anyone else wanna jump in here? Yeah, hey, it's Sarah. Um, Thanks, so like, I feel like the, the text is basically saying like, our basic needs for life, for life, like uh, food, shelter, Torah, um, are uh, cannot exist without the others. So that we all we need, they're connected as they one, um, yeah, one to the other. Thank you. Yeah, I think part of what this is pushing us to do is not live a monolithic life, right? To see yeah. how in, interconnected <laughs> human needs are. Our spiritual lives and our physical lives are interconnected, right? Our right. inner life and our outer life is, in connect, is connected. Our Jewish life and our human life is as if such a binary was even possible. Right. Um, our ritual life and our ethical life. Like, don't think you can exist in one realm and neglect other realms of being, right? Mm -hmm. We need to be our full selves, right? Yep. Uh, I, respond, oh. I responded to the the auditory rhythm of the beginning of uh, the, the teaching. Um, it was as though the words as they're constructed are trying, are striving for the balance of human behavior, what the goal is and what we do. So Beautiful. I, I, I responded really to the rhythm of the beginning language. Yeah. Thank you for that. And um, um, I think that's exactly right. And we'll see some of the pushback. Like I think um, 
that we'll see in modern times. For example, ein kemach ein Torah, im uh, ein Torah ein kemach. This notion that, like, for example, that I should live by faith, I should go learn in kolel, like if a, as a Haredi person or the like, if I just learn in kolel, God will provide. Like, no, you need to do the work to like put food on the table, right? And um, and so too, if I just work, but I don't have a spiritual life to kind of support that, like that's also not going to be sustainable, right? And so for the secular person, the non-spiritualist, like there's a challenge. And for like this, this type of master of faith who thinks they can just put everything in God's hands and not have to do effort, there's also a challenge. And I think we see that throughout. And we can ask ourselves, and if you go back to each of those, those, those tensions, we can ask ourselves in each one, which one am I too heavy on, right? Um, and how can I find a little bit more of that balance as Nancy would say? Great, let's hear one more can person. I right jump now. in? Yes, please. Okay. Um, Hi, Susan. Susan. Yeah. So I think from the very opening, you get this balance between conduct and action. Action. I'm going to use the word action more than even conduct. Yeah. Um, and and learning. And so I'm thinking of um, kadoshim to you and all of the injunctions that we have. And I'm also thinking about. Um, I, I'm also thinking about um, davening. Um, when we get to the point of Lil Mode and Lil Ahmed and Lishmoa, and it's like these are action words, and that without doing those actions, without actually taking, if you're just studying Torah, just to say I'm studying Torah, and I guess I'm going to jump in that some of the more recent um, uh, prakim that we've been looking at about studying Torah bother me a, a little bit personally because they're so focused on on study of Torah but if you just study without taking that to heart and having that affect who you become and who you are and how you navigate through the world then um, then you're kind of missing the point so mm -hmm. it all wraps itself up with the tree that has the roots Great. and so without without acting you're just kind of, you're floating here and there. Great, um, great. And you Thank need you. those roots of action. Good, so Susan, you moved us in a bunch of helpful directions here because you talked about Kiddoshim to you, which is gonna be our next source in a moment. And you moved us back to the notion of the tree. And so- um, Rabbi, may I say something? I'm oh, sorry. Oh yeah, please, one, one more, then we'll move on. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead, Marva. I'm terribly sorry. Um, first of all, I just wanna say that the um, imagery is very beautiful. Um, using the metaphor of the tree. Um, and I don't have uh, really an interpretation to offer, but an observation that the roots might spread very wide, but we never see roots. And that was the only of the two trees that bore fruit. So mm -hmm. just an observation there. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's why one of the reasons um, I like to, you know, that tikkun olam, repairing the world, comes from tikkun ha'alem, repairing the hidden dimensions. If you try to repair the surface level, you can cause more damage. You have to get um, that something sustainable has these roots that we need to water and nurture. And that's actually an interesting segue because what is the birth of moral consciousness in the Torah? Where does the birth of moral consciousness occur? In Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eden, they are like robots without a moral conscience. And then they eat from Eitz Hadat Tovira, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in that first ethical choice, actually interesting that ethics is born through food justice, right? That's the first act of food consumption where ethics are born. It shows how interconnected uh, food justice issues are to um, our, our basic sense of morality that it's a tree, it's a tree there. Um, and this imagery of, of the tree, Eitz Chaim He, um, this notion of life being tied up to the tree and our sense of ethics being connected to this tree. And like Margot was saying there, this power of the roots that you can't even see. And that's what's hard in our day, that the parts of our li lives that might matter most, either that hurt the most or that um, give us the most joy and meaning are oftentimes the parts that people can't see. And that's why social media and public perceptions can be so painful to live in that surface reality because we want people to see us, but those roots can never be seen in a sense. And so 
what we're going to look at here is building off this first idea in this Pirkei Avot of Im Ein Torah Ein Derech Eretz. Now, Derech Eretz um, officially translates as like the way of the land, like the custom of the land, the manners or the customs. Um, but I think that the, um, the, the general thrust that commentators have taken over the millennia has been um, that this means basic uh, moral conduct, basic moral conduct. Now that's strange to have as kind of an oppositional force or complementary force to Torah, because what is Torah if it's not including that? But it's interesting to see how those are kind of split, uh, separated out a little bit. And I think that part of where it moves us back to meyat min or doche harba min ha is that um, we might think of Torah as confined. When I'm learning Torah, when I'm doing a ritual, when I'm doing Jew talk, when I'm in shul, whatever it is, right? But actually, derech eretz is like, no, don't, don't, don't come to think this can be compartmentalized. The derech eretz means like, this goes everywhere with you on the land. Anywhere you go, this is the stuff of menshlekite that comes with you. And that is to say, if somebody said to me, what are the top five Jewish ideas in the world? I would say one of the five would be everything matters. Everything matters. What we choose to eat, what we choose to say, what we do with our money, what we do with our time, everything matters. That's derech eretz. The way I walk on the land in the world matters. Maimonides in his Hilcho Teshuva um, says, we should view our next action in the world as if there was a scale and our next action was gonna tilt the scale either towards the redemption of the world or the destruction of the world. Now I'm sure few of us, maybe none of us actually believe in the power of our next action to do such a thing. But the thought experiment Maimonides wants us to live with is take your life seriously, right? That our next choice actually could be profoundly meaningful or transformative in some way. It's like if someone came to you tomorrow, or they can say they came to me, they said, I'm going to give you $86,400 every day for the rest of your life. Say, whoa, where do I sign up? I'm done with this rabbi gig. $86,400. Here's the one rule. You can't save the money. Every day you got to spend it all. There's no bank account to save it in. Right? In fact, that's the gift we've been given. 86,400 seconds every day of our lives. And there's nowhere to save those seconds. There's no bank to save them in. We are given the, the gift of moments. And then there's nanoseconds. If we look at the billions of nanoseconds we exist in, um, in terms of how the brain might operate in relation to nanoseconds. And so, and so everything ultimately matters. And that is the notion of derech Eretz, right? That there is no Torah over there. Now I'm in Torah life. Now I'm in secular life. Now I'm at work, right? Now I'm at home, right? But actually derech Eretz, the menshelikite we have to ultimately live with. Okay, now I appreciate that Margot, or not, not Margot, um, but someone, maybe it was Margot, but maybe it was Tony, moved us to Kadoshim to you. Um, yes, uh, so um, so I'm gonna go to my next, my next source here. And um, this is one of the most famous Rambans, Nachmanides, not to be mistaken with the Rambam or Maimonides. Um, the Ramban is one generation after him and he argues with him on many things. The Rambam was a rationalist and the Ramban was a mystic and um, they have a lot of disagreements. And here's one of the most important um, Rambans to know. And it'll resonate for many of you as you've heard before. Can I get a new reader, please? Someone to read Nachmanides for us. Don't be shy, just unmute yourself. Okay. And thou shalt be holy, for I, the Lord, thy God, am holy. And the meaning is as follows. The Torah has admonished us against sexual immorality and forbidden foods, but permitted sexual intercourse between a man and his wife, and the eating of meat and drinking of wine. If so, a man of lust could find the legal... Oops. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so, if so... Um, um, okay, so a man of lust could find the legal allowance to be lustfully addicted to sexual intercourse with his wife or with wives and to be among the wine imbibers and gluttonous eaters of flesh and speak freely all profanities since this prohibition 
has not been stated explicitly in the Torah. Thus, he will be a base, sordid man within the allowance of the Torah. Okay, great. So I, we're going to keep going, but I want to just pause there because this is a, a very important phrase if you're not familiar with it to know. Naval birshut Torah. Naval birshut Torah. A disgusting person with the permission of Torah. Wow, how's that even possible? I thought if I live by Torah, I'm, I'm a virtuous person. No, the Ramban says, you can live Torah and be disgusting. He says, oh, you could be like, I keep kosher, but then you just be totally insensitive to the treatment of animals, to the treatment of workers, to the treatment of the environment. You can be gluttonous. You can, you can just eat like totally unhealthy foods all the time, right? We cannot care about any of, any of the ethical dimensions behind the food. Like, oh, but I keep kosher. That's what the Torah says, right? Or be like, I'm only having sexual relations with my partner, um, not, you know, not with someone else, and yet do it in a way that doesn't bring, uh, inspire mutuality or love or admiration or be addicted where one, um, you know, is over the top or aggressive in any ways. I mean, yeah, he says, oh, well, you've, you, you've yes, you're, um, you're, you're not just sleeping around or committing adultery, but you are disgusting within the permission of Torah. Okay, so, we're, um, all right, so let, let's go back and keep reading there. Let's finish that Ramban. Lisa. Okay. Therefore. Okay, I have to move it a little bit. There we go. Therefore, the Torah came after having listed the specific matters which are completely forbidden and commanded in a general sense that we should restrain ourselves from even in permitted realms, moderation of appetite. And such is the way of Torah to command and prohibit in the specific and then command and prohibit in the general. Thus, after warning about the detailed laws regarding business dealings and all matters of business between people, thou shalt not burglar, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not cheat, and all similar prohibitions, the Torah states in general, and you shall do that which is right and good. Good, so there's one more paragraph, but I just want to pause to show the, the important, the important um, Hebrew on that last phrase. Ve'asita hayashar ve'hatov. That beyond particular meets vote, we should do what is, is just and good, right? And that's not going to be clear what that is. It's not just going to say, like, don't eat chametz on Pesach, or like fast on Yom Kippur, or don't steal. Like beyond the, the, the detailed level, do what is just and good, okay? One more paragraph here, Lisa, thank you. Okay. Thus commanding us that we should commit ourselves to the doing of what is right and equitable and all that is beyond the letter of the law for the sake of our fellow man, as I will explain there. And similarly, when it comes to Shabbat, the Torah prohibits the various forms of work with a negative prohibition and effort and labor, which are not mal malachot with a positive commandment, as it says, you shall rest. Great, great, so thank you. Lisa, for reading that. Um, and I, I want to get reactions to this. And um, before I do, one other phrase that emerged in that last paragraph, lifnim mishurat adin, going above the letter of the law. That might be a concept we, we sometimes don't appreciate. We might think of it as like halachic stringency, like, whoa, why, where did that come from? Why are we being so stringent on this? But we might appreciate it on issues of ethics, where you say like, well, the Torah doesn't say pay a living wage. Or the Torah doesn't say, like, be concerned about climate change. Or the Torah doesn't say, like, racism is evil. Like, show me that verse, right? Right? To, uh, to, to take obvious ethics that we care about. And, um, and you can do some acrobatics to kind of show how we get there over the millennia. But it's not going to be there from the Torah itself. And so the Ramban says, Leaf ni go above the letter of the law. Do what's just and good. And know that if you only do what the Torah says, you will be, you have the, are at risk of being disgusting with the permission of Torah. So good, so I'd like to get some reactions to that. Do you agree with the Ramban? Where does this lead you? Yes. My first reaction, Tony, again, my, not to be flipped, but my first reaction to that is I wish Samuel Alito had read that. <laughs> <laughs> And if it's only enumerated, it's not, doesn't count. <laughs> it seems to me um, that, that what this is implying 
is that the basic ethical constructs of Torah are what's important and they get explicated or operationalized through some specific behaviors and acts, both positive behaviors and prohibited behaviors. But really the priority is on the ethics and living the ethics. Beautiful, beautiful. It reminds me of the story that many of you I'm sure has heard where um, Rabbi Yisro Salanter, it, some people tell it of a different person, but the founder of the Musar movement, went to inspect the matzah factory. And after a long inspection, the owner said, so new, will you give us your hashkacha that this is kosher matzah? The whole city is waiting for it. And he said, absolutely not. He said, What's, what did we do wrong? Did we use too much water? Did we bake it too long? There's no chametz here. It's all kosher matzah. He said, you see those women back there you have working? There's practically blood on their fingertips. You haven't given them a break in hours. This is not kosher matzah, right? that we can become so confused by the technical dimension that we miss what the whole thing is about. So Deborah, yeah, thank you for that point. Anyone else wanna jump in there? Great, and so this is what Rabbi Soloveitchik also called uh, when he said halakha is a floor, not a ceiling. That the rules or the basis of kind of what's explicit is the floor, but that's not, that's not the end of religious life or Jewish life. There's a whole space to kind of build on top of that. And of course, some of that ethical life is even gonna change how we engage with that ritual life. For example, I just came back from Israel. And in Israel, as you know, it's a Shemitah year, it's a sabbatical year. And you're gonna have a whole, and if that's something someone is interested in participating in, you're gonna have a whole bunch of choices as to where you're gonna buy, how you're gonna buy your fruit and vegetables. Let me tell you some of the choices. There is the choice of, that's called, um, Meets Ryan. <laughs> you're gonna buy your fruits in, uh, from Egypt, right? Literally, right? You're gonna you can buy nochri, which means Jews can't work the line, land, but Gentiles can. So you're gonna buy Gentile grown, grown crops. Then there's what's called um, heter mechira, which means um, uh, that Jews kind of still own it, but they kind of sold it through like a legal maneuver um, towards a Gentile, so that they don't lose out on this experience. Then there's the idea of 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 Otzer Beitin, um, of that a, a court becomes the owner of it. So again, there's not a loss of profit for all these workers, right? This was part of the socialist vision early, in early um, Eretz Israel around um, working the land and the ability to like say that farmers ought to be able to have a good livelihood. So now you have this opportunity to be like, okay, I get this idea called sabbatical year. Now what's the goal? Is the goal to give the land a rest? Then nobody should work it. We should buy from Egypt or Cyprus or, or wherever. Is the goal that the worker gets a rest? Every worker? Is the goal that, um, that we build relationships with Arab workers, right? And develop that partnership? Is the goal that Jewish workers ought to be able to be sustained through this, right? Is the goal just submitting to God so that no one is working them? Like we'd have to figure out like, what is my ethic in relationship to this ritual? Because it's not obvious. Right? And I think that emerges in constantly in these, in these rituals. For example, when I fast on Yom Kippur, what am I trying to do? Am I saying that eating is bad? Am I saying that eating is good, but my break will enable me to return to it with a new moral consciousness? Right? What am I doing when I make Kiddush on Friday night? Right? Um, uh, what am I trying to achieve at Pesach Seder? Right? These rituals, if they aren't directly connected to an ethical thrust, like we may have missed what they're actually trying to achieve. We might say if we went to Pesach Seder and we didn't come out um, willing and able and more informed on how to work towards liberation, like what did we do? Did we fulfill Pesach? Right? If I do, if I make Kiddush and I don't think about the stranger, because I mentioned, I mentioned, you know, the gear there, like have I actually said Kiddush? Right? So, um, so I think it, it, it's an interesting way to think about this relation between Derech Eretz and Torah. Um, okay, I see some comments in the chat, which folks can read as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go back, jump back into our source here to go to the next source and feel free to jump in if, if uh, at any point you want to. So this next source comes from Rav Kook. Rav Kook, as you know, is the first Ashkenazic chief rabbi of pre-state Israel. And he writes over here an idea that is picked up by Professor Tamar Ross, and I'll, I'll flesh that out in just a moment. He writes, this is a great principle in the war of ideas. Any idea that comes to contradict something in the Torah 
the first thing that we must do is not necessarily to refute it, but rather to build the palace of Torah above it. In that way, we become elevated. And through that elevation, the ideas reveal themselves so that afterwards, when we are free of all pressure, we can fight against them with full confidence. Okay, so Rav Cook is saying here, oh no, there's a new idea that emerged. It seems to clash with what we call Torah in the past. Like, and so some people are gonna say, well, we have to dismiss this. We have to combat it because it's a threat to us, right? But Rav Cook says, build the palace of Torah a, even bigger, expand the palace of Torah through this new innovation. He famously says, Hayashan yitchadesh vehachadash yitchadesh. May the old become new and may the new become holy. Right? So Professor Tamar Ross builds her feminist theology upon this Rub Cook idea. And she wrote a wonderful book, if you haven't read it before, called Expanding the Palace of Torah. She, she was at Bar-Ilan University. She lives in Israel, just a great theologian and a Rav Cook scholar. And she says, oh, don't pretend the Torah is feminist. It's not. It's anachronistic to try to pretend that modern, modern ideologies are there in the ancient world. It's just not. But can we be feminist, Torah Jews, in whatever sense that means, in the most pluralistic sense of how we understand it being a, you know, a Jew engaged with Torah? She says, yes, because Torah expands when new good innovations emerge. Democracy emerges. Don't pretend the Torah was democratic. It wasn't. It was a monarchy, right? It was, yes, Michael Walzer at Princeton um, shows how the Bible um, sets the foundation for later democracy in three or four very powerful ways, he demonstrates. And yet, it's not democratic, it's anachronistic, right? Democracy is a modern idea. And so he said, democracy emerges, don't refute it, say, oh, we're just monarchists because that's what the Torah was, King David, right? But actually build, let Torah expand, right? Now we're gonna have a state of our own in Israel. We need to ensure it's democracy. Now we have, so we participate in sovereignty in America, fight for democracy to ensure it's democratic. Right now, feminism is, is, is a central Jewish idea, not because it's there in the Torah, but because this, the palace of Torah expands. And so Derek Eretz in relationship to Torah is not just these two static ideas that exist. Like actually Torah is expanding as it's in relationship to this Derek Eretz. As I become a feminist, as I become a universalist, as I engage in social justice, as our intellectual ideas expand. Now that doesn't mean that everything goes. The newest thing is the best thing, right? That, 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 that's a great idolatry. Whatever's the newest idea is like the, is like the most correct thing. But when we use our filter, and Pirkei Avot is gonna get to this point later, as, as we know, this notion of, be, of embracing this positive type of filter where the, we hold on to the good and let the bad fall away, that ultimately, that is incredibly generative for Judaism. And we might even say, this is why Judaism is one of the most powerful of ancient ideas, which is still has a transformative potential in our own day. Because we have, we, I, I don't wanna say we've mastered, but Judaism has this art and skill of holding the old while embracing the new. That is not obvious in faith traditions in the world today. Right? This ability to both be rooted, go back to the tree, be rooted and continue to generate new leaves, to be innovative and be traditional. So okay. I but, have just yes, a, please. A, yes, please, Sonia. Rabbi, um, why, why the use of the word war of ideas and even mm -hmm. ending, I don't see the, the, what you're sharing with us any longer, but I think it ended with, ultimately we're, we're confident to be able to wage that war again or something like that. And, and I, I don't understand that given what, what you're describing. Oh, great. Let me just put the text back up so we can see exactly what you're talking about. Thank you so much. So yes, let's go to that end part. In that way, we become elevated and through that elevation, the ideas reveal themselves so that afterwards, when we are free of all pressure, we can fight against them with full confidence. So fighting against them with full confidence just doesn't do it for me. And I'm sorry, I mean, it's a, a picky little thing, Thank but it's you. disturbing to me because it seems in some ways 
You know, we've been talking from the beginning, I think Tony mentioned, and you've been mentioning this tension between, you know, different, different values, different qualities, different impulses, but, but this seems, it, it seems not appropriate to the idea that, that, that this person is founding. Can I, Great. can I jump in? Yes. Yes, please jump in. Thank you, Sonia. Hi, Susan. Um, so I actually think fighting against it is, is a piece that's necessary, but I hear the hesitation and I hear why it's problematic. But I feel like I'm going to go back to Kudoshim again. And for me, one of the most powerful um, psukim in that, one of the most powerful um, 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 declarations is like you have the right to rebuke your neighbor. And so I think, and I'm going to weave that back in with the Nachmanides, and especially with the fact that it opened up with these kind of sexual and sexuality, uh, you know, um, which is also anachronistic, you know, it's from Nachmanides time, because certainly now, like in Shul last week, we whispered, the whoever read Torah whispered when it came to a man lying with a, a woman. So if we don't have the power mm -hmm. to fight and to not be so, you know, because to me, I'm gonna be like very frank and honest. It's disgusting for me, for somebody who thinks they're so righteous, but makes people feel disgusting about who they are. That's maybe midakdek. That's like very, you know, you're very specific and and following the rules of the Torah, but you're not very humanistic and you're not thinking about the growth. And so the idea that we have to fight for these ideas, if we don't fight for these changes and ideas, um, then we stay stuck in the anachronism. Thank you, thank you, um, yeah, thank you for that. And before Deborah. I just want to share um, uh, one word about the philosophical roots of the Rav Cook idea here. Rav Cook philosophically would fall out into the camp called the Hegelian camp. Mm -hmm. He's a reader of Hegel. And what that means is that there is thesis, mm -hmm. there is antithesis, and in that clash is progress mm -hmm. where we now have synthesis. And so he believes there is historical progress. He's a progressive, so to speak, theologically and historically. And, um, and that progress emerges through wars. Like the birth of modernity emerges in a war of the, the poor working class against the, uh, the monarchs, right? That's revolution. And that's Karl Marx as a Hegelian, right? There needs to be a revolution, an overthrowing. And so Rav Cook also thinks that we want to get to synthesis. But you know what happens once we get to synthesis? We become stale again. And then we get a new antithesis and a new war and now a new form of progress. Now, um, that might sit well with some of us and not well with others, but that's where he's coming from. And so when he says, he picks up on the verse, Talmidei chachamim marbim shalom ba'alam. That sages increase peace in the world. He said, sages increase peace. What are you talking about? Have you read the Talmud? They don't increase peace. They increase arguments. Machloket. Haven't you read the Talmud? All they do is argue. That's not peace. He says, ah, oh, that's the point. The deepest, most sustainable, lasting peace is built through argumentation. Once you have that clash or war of ideas, then emerging from that will be a deeper truth. That is the Talmudic way a battle it out. And through that, we will reach something deeper. Um, now, that's why, you know, people come and say, Rabbi, will you perform our wedding? I, I say, I, I have some questions for you. One of my questions is, tell me how you fight. They say, oh, good news, Rabbi, we don't fight. I say, I can't perform your wedding. You don't fight. So I can't imagine how many arguments are below the surface. I want to know that you argue, but you argue generously and kindly, right? But if you're not actually arguing, there can't be any peace, right? Because there has to be something brought to the surface. And so, um, I think we can reject that idea of war, as, as Sonia is saying, and I think I appreciate what Susan, Susan said also, and I think that that's kind of where Rav Cook is coming from, that he, for example, he looks around the ultra-Orthodox world in, in the 1920s, and he, and he sees them rejecting a return to the land. He said, no, we can't come till the Messiah comes. He goes, no, no, nationalism is emerging right now, and that is the zeitgeist, and even though that's new, we're going to embrace that, and... Um, 
and in embracing that new thing of nationalism, we are and universalism that's going to emerge from that. Um, there's going to be some tensions involved there, yeah. right? And maybe even a competing nationalism, and that's going to be a part of the process that we can't turn away from. Ultimately, yes, Deborah. Yeah, I have a question about. Um what you were saying before, where in its best sense, we preserve the old, but we allow the new to seep in. Um, and I wanna probe what preserving the old means with an example. Um, some years ago, I was studying Torah and the mitzvah about shotness came up, uh, the mixing of linen and wool and the prohibition against wearing garments. And somebody in the study session said, that never had any meaning for me, the prohibition against wearing these garments. But this year I thought about it and thought about kind of what could be the ethical foundation of that concern. And the way I translated it is kind of how a garment is made and is it made in an ethical way? So I've decided that for me, the prohibition against shotness means looking at labels when I'm going to buy clothing and, uh, and only buying the clothing with quote kosher labels, okay? I like that notion very much. Um, that is a sensible way for me to look at um, some of the mitzvot that ha have, have no meaning to me, just blindly observing them as they're written. But that, that is not, is that preserving the old or is that not? And is that a slippery slope? Great, I love that, I love that. So just a few comments there um, and we're all gonna have our own leanings there. I think there is this powerful idea that Deborah's referring to here of how like, there are these ancient Torah vehicles that in their purest form, so to speak, might not resonate for us. And yet in their applied form resonate so deeply, we can just be like kosher. Like what a, what a strange outdated way to think of, of the world. Like, like these things aren't unclean anymore. Or we can say like Reb Zalman said, eco kashrut, right? I'm concerned about kashrut as a vehicle towards the land and the worker and, and, and the environment, whatever. Or Shmita, like, oh, Shmita, like, I don't believe God said that, or I don't think we have to, like, stop working the land. Or, like, is this a vehicle for economic justice, right? And there's so many things like that. Or the Ir Hamiklat, like, we're not going to set up these cities of refuge, but is this a model for criminal justice reform and rethinking mass incarceration in a whole new way? And so that's where I think that the Jewish social justice work and the Jewish ethics work actually contribute something unique to society when we tap into that wisdom of its roots and apply it. Now to Deborah's question of like, where is the slippery slope there? Um, well, I won't give my own answer to that because I think it's worth us all thinking about how we think about the integrity of our own religious and spiritual lives, right? Do, do we just, when do we do just what's easy or what feels good versus what we believe to be true and, and believe to be good? Um, those are not, those are not easy questions for any of us. And I think that, um, that it is, um, uh, it's very hard for us moderns to even ask the question of Kant, which is like, if, if called the categorical imperative, if everyone did what I am doing now, would that be good for the world? Like, ah, I'm going to cut the line a little bit or take an extra penny off the tab, whatever. Like, who cares? Nobody's going to notice, right? But if everyone did that, like, what would the world look like? So too, as Jews, like, would Judaism be sustained if every Jew lived how I'm choosing to live? Like, these are hard questions to think about. And the slippery slope of, like, of, like, in a very loose sense, preserving, right, an idea. Like, let's say somebody said, um, Yom Kippur, like, nah, I don't like shul. And fasting doesn't feel so good. And like, I find the liturgy out of date, like just alienating. Like my Yom Kippur is going to the beach and having a barbecue and being joyful. And that's my Yom Kippur. For some people it'll be like, oh, that's beautiful because you found your own Judaism. And for other people it'll be like, that is a total distortion of what Judaism is. And maybe we have a middle ground where we say, you know, that yes, there's some evolution, but it takes time and it's not gonna be perfect. And so I think part of the humility of participating in this stuff is, is to say, it's not just about me. 
if it was just about me, it wouldn't be called Judaism, it'd be called meism, right? But I'm gonna participate in something greater than me, right? And all of it's not gonna feel good and right, but that's what it means to be in a community. If I didn't want that, I would just stay in my family room. Like, what do you need a community for? I, I, th because the temperature can be just what I want in my family room. The volume can be just what I want, right? What's on TV or what's book in my hand, the pace can be, it's just how I want it. But that's hubris, that's narcissism. Being in a community means 30 to 40% isn't working for me. But the 30 to 40% that's not working for me is working for someone else in the room. And that's what it means to be in a community. So if we just evolved everything as we wanted it, right? Um, we couldn't sustain it. We couldn't say, so that's, that's a hard question. That's a hard question. And, and I think we're, all of us who are in this room, I think are willing to throw out the two extremes. One extreme, which we might call a, a, a kind of a Haredi view, which is like change nothing. In fact, change it by being so, so committed to changing nothing. We build more walls around it to the extent that we've actually changed it, right? And then there's the ultra secular view, which says like, toss it all. It's all out of date. It's all irrelevant, it's all lies. Like religion is all just a corruption. I think we all understand there's an integrity here and part of the integrity is preserving and part of it is in the evolution. And I think we need teachers and friends. We really trust their integrity to guide us on these things. Hi, Ronald, I see your hand up and then Sarah. You're still on mute over there. I'm so sorry. Okay, uh, all good. I had a class with Art Green this morning and he talks about halacha. For him, halacha is not the law of punishment, falling off the path. It's the walking with the path, along the path. And for many of us, uh, that's what it is. Uh, like what you said, looking at the labels and the finding ways. Um, I mean, of course, you, you give an, ex an extreme example about Yom Kippur, of course, and then going to have a barbecue on the beach. So that's maybe pushing to the other extreme. But um you know the, the 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 whole thing about linen and wool and things like that I mean, there's certain things where you 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 have to adjust to your own uh time and your own way of walking the path towards um uh, towards more holiness and what you're saying so that my next step is it going to <clears throat> to go deeper in yourself and understanding what you are about and what you should be doing um uh, is, is, is the path of Allah much more perhaps than uh, anything else. Great, thank you for that. I was just with Rabbi Dr. Art Green in Jerusalem a few weeks ago, and we were chatting about that particular point in his home. Um, and, um, and, and I really appreciate that. There are those who translate this as Jewish law. This is a legal tradition that we are bound by. And there's those who treat this as a spiritual tradition that like, this is the way I walk in the world. Um, and you can even translate halakha as progress. Like this is moving forward. This is the way of us being rooted, but walking forward in the world in a sense. Like what, how do I bring my full integrity with that way I walk? Yes, Sarah, I see your hand up, Sarah. Yeah, so it's actually interesting. My mom and I were recently having this discussion over dinner um, about uh, specifically about the clothing part, not related to, to Judaism, but specifically about how, you know, the U.S., like we all, you know, most companies like export all their clothing to these developing countries. And so many of the, you know, workers are, are treated, you know, horribly and like slaves, like slaves and all these, and they're child workers and all this horribleness. And it's like, the problem is, it's like, because, I mean, I'm sorry, but the only sort of ethically made clothes that I like know of it if anyone has any you know knows of any clothing sorry I'm digressing but clothing companies that actually have ethically made clothes that would be great because you know the only the only ones you ever see are in Whole Foods they're exorbitantly expensive and in my opinion not so attractive <laughs> so it's like I'm not gonna go buy that stuff you know it's like I don't you know how do you where where do you get you know we talk about that and it's important but where then where do you go buy you know stuff that's that is ethically made and, and is ethically grown because, well, yeah, it's overpriced. Thank you. There's Thank none of you. it. And this is part of our problem today, that in some, going back to wisdom exceeding deeds, today, many of, a lot of our ethics actually are running too fast for our ability to fulfill them. I'll give you an example. One project I'm involved with is um, giving an ethical certification to kosher restaurants that they're not only kosher, but they're also yosher. They treat their workers properly. Now that sounds great, but we've been able to convince very few um, Jews who um, in any way care about kashrut to actually change their consumer patterns. Take Manhattan. We have you know, a dozen or two of these places certified. And even though we, 
inform the community, people say, ah, I really like this restaurant, or this one's a little cheaper, or this one's closer to home. People who might say, oh, ethical kashrut matters a lot to me, but then there's a behavioral change. So too, we might care, as Sarah's saying, about, about our clothes and the sources, and yet the fair trade labels is so behind where we need it to be because it's such a complex industry. And sometimes we just know too much or look at the issues around harassment or abuse today, right? We hold certain wisdom around ideals and yet there's, there, is, um, there is so um, much uh, misinformation um, and our ability to even be heard and people to be seen and heard. And so it's a messy world. And so how do we, how do we live with that? How do we make sure that our deeds actually transcend our wisdom? Okay, I know there's some more hands up but I wanna do our last source and then I'll open it back up to folks. Um, and this source, can I just well, say I one more quick thing? There's a, there's a, sorry, there's a certain um, company of, um, I know in India, there was this, there was a great documentary on Netflix about how women in India were making sanitary uh, pads and that's how they were like becoming employed and sort of, and fulfilling their, you know, bringing, bringing life to their communities because these women were able to go work and make, and make essential, you know, material for their, for their menstrual cycles. It was, it's a great documentary. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Right. How, how amazing is it when we do the right. work to learn about heroic women like that in the global South or wherever they are and be able to lift them up um, and partner with them in ways that bring dignity. Um, and thankfully there are ways to participate in that kind of work um, as opposed to buying blood diamonds or as opposed to supporting exploitative labor and the like. So thank you for that. And that is what our learning is about. It says here in Brachot, but here, Tachlit Chachma Tshuva Masim Tovi. The point of our wisdom, this is the point of it, is that it leads us towards transformation and towards doing more ethically in the world. Now, here's the closing story I want to share in this text here, because it really jumps out. Now, this there, there was a, a modern Orthodox rabbi named Rabbi Aaron Lichtenstein. And here's a story that he shares that will resonate, um, I think, for us, regardless of um, if, we're, if we're from his camp. Here's what he writes. A couple, a couple of years ago, after we moved to Yerushalayim, I was once walking with my family in the Beit Yisrael neighborhood where Rabbi Isser Zalman Meltzer used to live. For the most part of it, it consists of narrow alleys. We came to a corner and found a merchant stuck there with his car. The question came up as to how to help him. It was a clear case of Prika Uta'ina, helping one load or unload their burden, right? They unload their donkey, but here it's a car, right? There were some youngsters there from the neighborhood who judging by their looks were probably 10 or 11 years old. They saw this merchant was not wearing a kippah upon his head. So they began a whole peopol, a whole Talmudic discourse based on the Gemara and Pesachim about whether they could help this guy or not, right? They said, if he walks about bareheaded, presumably he doesn't separate his trumot or maestro. So he's suspected eating and selling untithed produce. Like, do we help this guy? He's like a, he's like a, a heathen, right? Because he's like not this religious guy that, that these Haredi kids are, are used to. I wrote to Rabbi Soloveitchik, that's his father-in-law, um, a, a letter at the time and told him of the incident. I ended with the comment, children of the age from our camp would not have known the Gemara, meaning a modern, a more modern person wouldn't have even known the Gemara these young Haredi kids know, but they would have helped the guy. My feeling then was why Rabboni Sha'olam, why God must this be our choice? Can't we find children who would have helped him and still know the Gemara? Do we have to make that choice? I hope not, I believe not. But if forced to choose, however, I would have no doubts where my loyalties lie. I prefer they know less Gemara, but help him. <laughs> now, this is a great text where he's struggling with being a modern religious person and his relationship to this Haredi community. And he's like, oh, he, this is a guy who spent every, like, every day of his life in the Beit Midrash learning Talmud. And he's like, why don't our youth in our modern camps know enough? Like they know all the modern songs. They know what's going on in politics, right? They're gonna go get PhDs in chemistry and political science and whatever else. But like their mastery of Talmud is very weak. Their understanding of like Jewish ethics and the source are very, you know, very weak. Um, but if I had to choose, like, I hope I don't have to choose like being Jewishly literate and being ethical. But if I have to make that choice as the guy who spends every day of his life learning Torah, he says, it's clear to me, I would rather they help than understand. And that's an interesting tension. I mean, even bracketing his conclusion of, geez, do we have to choose between being religious and being ethical? Do we have to choose between being learned and being compassionate? I sure hope not. So I was recently, um, you know, actually a few years ago now, 
I was I was running in, in the summer in Scottsdale, Arizona. If you've been here in the summer, you know it's like 120 degrees, like literally between 115 and 120 degrees. And I kicked the curb and I broke some some bones in my foot. And I'm laying on the side of the road for like an hour. I'm like, I'm gonna die here. I'm gonna die. I'm, I'm dehydrated. And all of a sudden, a woman on her bike is coming by. I go, oh, Mashiach. I always wondered what Mashiach looked like. There she is, right? I go to her, say, you gotta call my wife. I'm gonna die out here. I'm dehydrated. I broke my I broke my foot, right? Can you call? Can you call so I can go to the hospital? She looks at me. She looks at her watch, and she goes, oh. I'm so sorry, I'm late for church, right? <laughs> right? That it was this moment of religion actually getting in the way of like a humanitarian relief. Now to make clear that I'm not picking on Christianity because she could have said I'm late for mosque, I'm late for shul. Let me give a positive Christian story. I was recently in a coffee shop and I spilled my entire coffee on the guy's laptop next to me. I'm freaking out, oh, I'm so sorry. I ruined your laptop, please forgive me. I can't believe I did this. I'm so sorry. The guy looks at me, doesn't even look at his laptop. He goes, brother, it's all good. I said, what? No, no, it's not all good. My coffee's on your laptop. We got to fix it. I'm so sorry. He goes, he looks, brother, it's all good. I go up to the barista. I go up to the coffee maker. I said, do you know this guy? I just spilled coffee over his laptop. And he says, brother, it's all good. He says, ah, he's in the God business like you. I said, he is? And what do you know about me? He said, oh, we listen to all your conversations over there. He's a pastor down the road. And we know the work you do too. Right. So actually, but this guy, this guy said, when a moment emerges in my life where it appears I have the opportunity to enhance someone's dignity or care about stuff, I'm going to choose dignity over stuff. If somebody rear ends me, I'm not going to run out of the car screaming about my bumper. Right. I'm going to uh, see the person and see if they're OK. It's like the famous rabbi story where the, um, the rabbi's guest spills wine on the table and immediately the rabbi knocks over the kiddush cup you know, so that they're not embarrassed by, by this spilt over that. We don't, we care more about the person and their dignity than their stuff. Now, what's funny about the late to church story is that we have all these Rebbe stories about the Rebbe's on the way to Kol Nidre and they hear the cry of a baby and they run inside and they don't show up at Kol Nidre and they're soothing this baby. Like we have all these stories about like, or the, the, the famous altar Rebbe story where he's learning with his grandchild and um, there's a crying baby. And, and, the, and so he goes up and soothes the baby and comes back down and scolds the grandchild and says, if the cry of another doesn't cause you to pause your study of Torah, your, to your Torah is null and void, right? That if, 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 if there's not a deep ethical impulse and, and, and foundation and bedrock to what we're doing, it doesn't work. And so Rabbi Lichtenstein is struggling with that. And I struggle with that too. This idea that we wanna be Jewishly learned, we wanna be Jewishly engaged, we want Jewish continuity, Right, be rooted, but sometimes religion blocks us from ethics. And sometimes it becomes so full that there's no space left for the Derech Eretz. And so Pierre Piablo 317 comes and says, whoa, we're gonna have to construct the life of Torah and Derech Eretz. That's gonna be really complicated to figure that out. How to be a particularist and a universalist, how to be you know, um, um, a centrist or a liberal or progressive or however, a conservative, whatever we think of ourselves as, right? And, and yet also hold space for others who have a slightly different political orientation than me, right? How I'm going to live Torah, but create space for other people of different religions, different denominations. This is not gonna be easy. This is not gonna be easy. And so um, um, I, I have one more thought to share, but let me just pause and see if there's, um, if there's another question that has emerged from anyone, because I know we have only five minutes left here. Not that it's the point, but how did you get, how, how, did, how did that story end with the broken leg on the side of the road? Yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a long story, I don't the have point. to go there, but I, I was okay. fine, I, 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 got, I, I got home and I, somebody got me home and I got it fixed. Oh my but God, how horrible, that you. person is not nice. Thank you for asking. No, but here, but the truth is, Sarah, is that <laughs> I, I, I am that person. We are that person. Oh yeah. And I'll, tell, and I'll tell you why. Because if any of us had a person dying at our footstep, right, um, dying at our feet, and we chose not to help them, we could we would pre be pretty sure that we're, we're a wicked person, right? If the person is dying and I choose to ignore them, I'm a wicked person. But here's the reality: uh, we're yeah. interconnected. If right. you can meet yourself, friends, uh, I, there's a lot of background noise. In, in our globalized, interconnected world, we don't need the person at our feet to know they're dying. We know today that in $3, I can save the life of another in the global South with a malaria net. We know there are people dying in Ukraine um, and, in, uh, and in Africa. 
and from all types of illnesses and <laughs> forms of poverty. It, they don't have to be at our feet. And so when I say I'm late for church, to some degree, we're all saying that every day. Like, I'm a little bit too busy to care about what's happening out there. And that's why I believe the greatest crisis of our day is the crisis of empathy. The University of Michigan recently showed the capacity for empathy in America has dropped 40% over the last few decades, right? That is to say, as a man, it's harder to know what it's like to be a woman. As a white person, what it's like to be of color. A straight person, what it's like to be queer. For a rich person, what it's like to live in poverty. For a citizen, what it's like to, to live undocumented. For a person with a body of abilities, what it's like to live with a body that has disabilities, right? That for each of us, it, it, it is becoming harder and harder for us to see the other, right? And that is the great opportunity of spiritual awakening in our day, when we can actually embrace our Torah to enhance our derech Okay, well, I think I have time. maybe time for one more question from maybe okay. someone we didn't hear from yet, if possible. Okay, so I'm gonna end with this little piece of Torah. And then I, I thank you all for your participation and your presence and this wonderful time. There's a great midrash that says, um, oh, I'm gonna hand it to uh, Cantor Mintz to, 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 to wrap up for us. Um, there's a great midrash that says, what's the most important pasuk in the Torah, the most important verse in the Torah? And the first suggestion is, oh, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. What's better than that? Jewish martyrs have died with those words on their lips for millennia. We are monotheists. There's one God. Then the second suggestion emerges. You shall love your other like yourself. Ah, because more than being monotheists, we're committed to ethics, right? Okay, ethical monotheism. So those are two great answers, right? Here comes the third answer. Human beings are all created with Selim Elohim in the image of God. Now the brilliance of that third suggestion is it posits, yes, there's a God like Shema Yisrael, and it affirms the second ethics. It says, yes, there's a God and the divinity within each person is the birth of our, of our moral commitment. So it combines the first two. So we could have stopped right there, right? Here comes the fourth one. Ben Pazi says, you should bring your Corbin in the morning and your Corbin at night. You should bring your animal sacrifice in the morning and your animal sacrifice in the, in the afternoon. You're offering twice a day. Now, tell me if I'm gonna get pelted and kicked out of the room for saying this. I don't yearn every day for the return of animal sacrifices in a third temple. Whoa, am I kicked out? Am I kicked out or am I okay here? I'm okay at BJ? Okay. In some circles, I would get kicked out for saying I don't yearn for a third temple with animal sacrifices right now, but I don't, partially because I'm a vegan. <laughs> I know Sarah, we talked about that. And I, I, as, a, as a vegan, I'm not so interested in animal sacrifices. Sorry. Right? Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> but, um, but, um, but why is Ben Pazzi the winner? Here's why I think Ben Pazzi is the winner. He is saying, Judaism is not a bumper sticker religion. We don't say, oh, I believe in one God. I, I'm good to go. I believe in ethics. I'm good to go. I believe all people are created in the image of God. I'm great. I'm going to make a Facebook post or have a bumper sticker that says I'm on board or I'm in the right political party or I'm a member of the right congregation. Right? Well, I, just by having an identity, I've done my job. No, Judaism says we are a people of action. Of the 613 meets vote, virtually all of them are actions. They're not in the realm of faith. They're not in the realm of belief or ideas, they are actions. Meets vote, we are people of, of action. Which is to say, friends, if we believe in something, how will we make it manifest in the morning? How will we make it manifest at the end of the day? What is the offering I will bring into the world twice a day? It's nice to believe in things. It's nice to have an identity. But if I believe it, what am I gonna do about it? And that's what I think this Pirkei Avot is pushing us to do. Learn Torah, but then go walk the walk. Then go, walk your talk. Walk the text out into the world. That's hard to learn enough, to know enough that it informs our action, but then to do enough that it represents that action. I thank you all so much. I'm going to pass it back to Cantor Mintz. Thank you so much for this time with you tonight. Well, Rav Shmuley, thank you so much for, for rooting this week and such, uh, such, such meaningful learning for us. Um, I just want to say, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is uh, part of a, a, a larger project, a lot a larger, larger initiative. And if you still have some thoughts percolating, some things that you wanted to share um, that you didn't have a chance or some, some ideas that, that you're still thinking about, I wanna encourage you to, uh, to visit our virtual community journal. The link, the link is in the chat. You can go in there. There are prompts 
on this week's questions about what are our um, essential values as a community, what those values are that are in conflict with one another and how we hold that all together. Um, so you can, you can go on our virtual community journal, you can respond in text, in video, in audio. Uh, we wanna hear from you, we, we wanna hear from, from your experience. And uh, of course, I wanna welcome you back uh, next week where we'll be learning uh, with Rabbi Joshua Feigelson from the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. Um, and just to tease out the, the, the following weeks after that, we can look forward to more learning with, uh, with Dr. Marjorie Lehman from JTS, the Jewish Theological Seminary, and finally, uh, Dina Weiss from Hadar. So there's much more, much more learning ahead, more discovery. And uh, I wanna thank everyone for being here. And since we, it is, uh, the right time for us here, here on the East Coast and take advantage of all being online together. Uh, we have a chance to, uh, to count the Omer for Sfirata Omer. I know uh, Shmuley, it's a little early for, for you, uh, but uh, if, you if you came from, from Minyan uh, earlier and still have your Sidur with you, uh, we're on page, uh, page 237 in, in Sidur Sim Shalom, uh, page 237, and tonight we're counting the, the 25th uh, day of the Omer, uh, the, the 25th day. Again, page page 237. Mm-hmm. Baruch Ata Adonai Lohinu Malach Olam Asher Kidshanu B'Mitzvotav V'Tivanu Al Svirat HaOmer Hayom Chamisha V'Esrim Yom Shehem Shlosha Shavuot V'Arbaa Yamim LaOmer. Erev Tov, everyone. Have a good evening. Hope to see you all very soon.